The following presentation is brought to you by Leadership Jacksonville. Funding provided by Jacksonville University. Hello, I'm Kent Lindsay. Welcome to this edition of the Jacksonville Legacy Series, presented by Leadership Jacksonville. Today's leader is truly a woman of firsts. The first woman to serve as a university president of a private college in the United States. The first woman to join the Jacksonville River Club. One of the first women to join the Rotary Club of Jacksonville downtown. And the first woman to serve as that club's president. Fran Kinney is a dedicated leader in education, the arts, and in strengthening and edifying our community. An author, an accomplished pianist, friend to many celebrities, Fran Kinney shows us all that you can accomplish much for your community, even while keeping a, a keen sense of humor. Join us now as we learn more about the life, the leadership, and the legacy of Fran Kinney. We want to talk about your early days um, in Iowa. How many decades ago? Quite a few decades. You can tell us. All right. About how your parents taught you the wow of life. How did they teach you that? In fact, that's my favorite word. Did you know that? Wow. For everybody, I, I, I cannot say how important it is to see and hear and feel the things that you can. Einstein was wonderful when he said, you can look at life in two ways. You can look at it as if nothing is a miracle, and you can look at it as if everything is a miracle. And that's what my parents taught me. Uh, it's wonderful that I grew up where I did in the Middle West because um, we had the ability to hear concerts, to go to plays. Uh, we, we had all these facilities around us, but I was a small town girl. When you were growing up, Go back to the first memories that you have. How did you see yourself in life? You formed your own vision. Tell us about that. The only thing I can remember is when I was really young, and I'm, I'm speaking of two years old, and I'm sure I didn't know anything about life, except that it probably was about me, I probably thought. But at any rate, uh, my mother was playing the piano. She had a beautiful voice and played the piano very well. But I do remember standing at the piano. Um, I remember listening to her play uh, the Irving Berlin, What'll I Do? I stood at the piano, because it was too small to sit on the chair, and I, st I stood there and played the melody on the piano. And it was that moment probably they recognized it that I had some musical ability. At 18, I signed a contract to teach music in a, in a small town that had a consolidated school. School was large, but the town was small. And uh, I really didn't know them. I knew a lot about music, but I really didn't know that much about what I should do with children. But my mother had been a teacher at 16. So she said to me, you need to get in command of that situation the very first day. So I was, uh, had the third and fourth grade, and someone told me before I went in there that there was this little boy, Herschel Toll was his name, I remember him. And uh, they said he's, he's delightful, but he's an imp, and he's gonna get, try to make a lot of noise, and, and he's gonna be a problem for you. And of course, being at 18, I thought, okay, what can I do? And I learned from my mother that I needed to use some psychology. So the very first day when I went in that classroom, and I can still remember it, I said, I'm looking for a young man that's, that's smart and, that, and can carry some books for me because I've got a lot of heavy music books and I don't think I can carry them. Up went the hands, but I knew which one was Herschel Toll. So I said, oh, Herschel, would you be willing to be my assistant? 
while I'm here. He was my assistant, and he was precious. Where did you go from there after you taught at the bigger school? Okay, then I had a chance. Then I went to, I was still studying at Drake, see, because I didn't have my degree yet. I was adding, I was doing Saturday classes, and then I meet the super, supervisor of music for Des Moines. And so he offered me a job. And um, he said, you're, if you won't tell your age, because I was just 20 then, he said, if you won't tell your age to everybody, because you're going to be by far the youngest teacher in, in the system. And so uh, they put, he put me in a, um, first, the first semester, he put me in an elementary school, um, which I enjoyed very much. And then the next semester, I got graduated up to a, a, a junior high and middle school. And it was then, we were in World War II, and I decided I needed to do something. I wanted to do something. And so I left teaching there. What did you decide to do? I, wa I wanted to enter, I, I really, the, uh, the Army had the headquarters for the wax in Des Moines. And I really wanted to become a WAC, but I knew that m with my vision that I couldn't. So um, my folks had a friend that was a representative in Congress. And so I even even wrote to him and said, there's something I can do. What can I do? And he said, well, they were, yes, they were starting the Army hostesses that had equivalent ranks to second lieutenants. And he said, but you're too young. He, I said, well, then I didn't give up. And I said, well, couldn't I get permission? I mean, couldn't I get special permission? And so I did get special permission. And so they sent me to Camp Crowder, which later became a Fort Crowder uh, in Missouri, away from everything. Mm -hmm. And I was there for three and a half years. So I was mighty young learning administration, which was priceless to me because I had charge of the snack bars and the, and the uh, entertainment. And, uh, and of course, again, here was with performance that entered into my life because I had an opportunity to schedule things for, for GIs. And we had uh, probably 70,000 GIs. And uh, I... I even brought the famous Joe Lewis, who was the, the world heavyweight champion at that time, and um, uh, Sugar Ray Robinson, who was a lightweight, and I brought them to, to camp and had them. Then I, I brought uh, a lot of famous baseball players and so on for them. That's where I got started on that. You have, you have a lot of connections, and you've met a lot of famous people, and they, and they all are reflected in your book as well, and they all think the world of you. How do you, how do, you do that? Well, I never paid anyone anything. I, I made up my mind that... So that's the key, not paying people? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I, I decided that the money should... There wasn't money to do it. In most cases, there wasn't, just, just like when I was at JU. I decided this get celebrities who deserved it and believed in the same things that I believed in, and then also that they would donate their time. And one time I think I did pay transportation for one, but otherwise. And then it was important they would spend time with students and in the community if we possibly could. And so that's where, I, that's where the celebrities that we, we got uh, would would mix in the community and be with the students. And they, I said, you have to stay. In, in almost every case, they would stay at least three days, sometimes four, sometimes a week. Probably the most often was um, the famous conductor of the Boston Pops. Arthur Feeder. Arthur Feeder. I had him 16 times. Wow. So the, you know, the kids, they would sit beside him, you know, or, or, or they got to know him. And then when he conducted the orchestras, they always overachieved. With, with him, as and then I were, then I was were active with the, the symphony Jacksonville Symphony at the same time, so I'd arrange for them for him to come and play there. And when the symphony didn't get on the stage for a year, uh, then I called and because because I was on the board and on the committee to help, and so I called Fiedler. Fiedler had scheduled a concert in San Francisco. He, and I told him, I said, we're desperate. We haven't had the symphony on the, on the stage for a year. And I said, you're the only one that could really, because people loved him. He'd been here so many times. And so he actually changed his appointment in San Francisco. And he came, and we, we paid off the debt in one night. We took him out to the Davis Ranch, 
uh, and Mr. Davis would show him the alligators and and uh, I, I think one of the funniest things he said was uh, that one one year um, we taught him how to call alligators. I know how to too. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's calling alligators, and they'll come across, they'll come across the the lake to see you, and so. <laughs> Of course, you don't really want them to come here. You know, so, so, but we showed him how to do that and so how to how to call them. And so, um, then a year later, he came back, and we went out to the ranch. And so, I don't remember if it was J. E. Davis or my husband that said, "Well, how did it work?" Because Feeler had said, "I'm going to go home and try this on Mrs. Feeler." And so, uh, but he said, "How did it work?" Feeler said, "Didn't work." <laughs> <laughs> Work better with alligators. <laughs> uh, how did you get, you know, to meet your husband? That's the, a wonderful story. Uh, actually, this is the, when the war ended. The VA Veterans Administration was after me to be a recreation director at their their large, very large facility, which they had outside of Fort Leavenworth. So they put made me director of all this entertainment, recreation and entertainment. And how old were you? Uh, see, I guess I was 25 wow. by that time, I think. 25. Yeah. And so uh, I'd go from hospital to hospital, and then I was getting volunteers to help. And, and, uh, so, and that worked out very well. And then one day this doctor friend of mine said, there's an older man, he's a colonel, and he's interested in meeting you. He's older than you are. And I said, oh, that's fine. You know, that didn't make any difference. And so he set up an appointment, but I worked all the time. I, I mean, just as I do now. And so he came to pick me up, and I lived in the nurses' quarters, and I wasn't there. And so uh, I felt foolish, and I know that I had been taught to act differently. So the next day, I ca I called I, I, and apologized. I said, "How does one apologize to to someone?" And he said just the way you, uh, to apologize for anyone, anything that you've done. And he was, out, I could see he was upset. So I, I said, I'm, when I'm, I'm really sorry. And so we set up another appointment. And that, that did it. <laughs> another appointment. <laughs> and who was that? That was Harry Loveland Kinney, oh. Jr., Colonel. How, how long before you married? We were married the next, see, the next year. And we were married in the little army chapel, which has very thick walls. It was a Pony Express station uh, oh during the Pony Express days. And that was in 1948. My husband took me to China first as a bride, and the communists chased us out. And then we were in Japan for three years, and then we were in Germany for four years. And I loved every minute of it. Tell us about those years. The, they were hectic, but they were, they were wonderful years. Mm -hmm. I learned so much. I really did. Uh, there probably are very few left who were in the occupation in both Europe and the Far East. I learned so much from the people themselves because in, in Tokyo, uh, I started a volunteer teaching program because their, their schools were just decimated. And they, and you know, I was criticized, I think, by one of my former friends who, who, in, in, who didn't really know the situation said, you're not going to be doing that. Those, that's our enemy. But these young, I was in a high school with, with um, a thousand young girls, cute. They were, they were eighth, ninth, tenth, and then through twelfth grade. And they didn't know anything about the war. And they were, they were just as sweet as they could be. And I thought, here's a good chance to teach them democracy. And, and they were eager and they were, they really wanted, they, they had, they, they had not had any contact with an American. And they, when they said, here comes this, here this woman's coming, I had two professors tell me they considered committing Harry Carey. <laughs> they absolutely, they, they were so afraid, they didn't know what, what I was going to be. And so, well, I didn't either, you know, <laughs> I didn't know what I was going to be either. But, I taught English, I taught Western civilization to them and tried to show them what, what our, a little bit about our culture. Finally in Frankfurt where, where 
I'm the only American studying on my doctorate, only American studying anything in, in the university. I had one professor that didn't, wouldn't even take me in a class. I had to get out of his class. Why wouldn't you I went home that? in tears because I was an American. Mm. I went home in tears. In China, uh, I was pushed off the sidewalk by the communists. I was spat upon, which really, really hurt my feelings. I was young and, and enthusiastic about helping them and then to have this happen. But then I went home to Harry and that because I, I felt alone. I felt very much alone. And uh, I went to Harry and, and uh, he was 15 years older, so he, he was much wiser. And he said, you have to remember that we almost destroyed this city in one night. And so everyone here probably has lost somebody. So you have to be more understanding and more compassionate. So he approached it in a different way. And I, then, I, then I felt, then I knew that, uh, that I wanted, my mission then was to try to get the people to work together. Uh, and, um, and it worked. After, it took about a year, but then, then they all accepted me. But uh, having been spat upon in, in China and pushed off the sidewalk and spat upon in Germany, I had to keep, I had to rely on my philosophy to know and to try to understand without being um, bitter. How did you do that? I did it. How did you do it? I did it using practicing what, what my parents had taught me and particularly not making judgments immediately on what happened to me. We had just arrived from Germany and we were going to move to California as soon as my husband finished his tour as the senior regular army advisor advising the Florida Guard. There we were and the telephone rang and it was Frank Johnson, the first president of JU, said we have lost a humanities professor we read the article in the paper. Well, actually, the article in the paper was about my husband. And it was a long article explaining what he was doing. And, and, then, and then right at the end, it said, and uh, his wife is Dr. Frances Kinney, and she has just received her doctorate in, in Germany. And so Frank saw that and called and said, uh, do you think you could come and help us out? And I turned to Harry and I said, do you think I could drive up there every day? Harry had given me uh, a Volkswagen when, when I got my doctorate. He said, my wife is not very smart. I offered her either a bug or he, she could have a Mercedes. And she chose a bug. And it's not even air conditioned. It's, I thought it was cute. So, so actually that's, then I said, I'll help you out for a month. Then it was two months. Then it got to be three years of 47,000 miles. I drove back and forth for three years. In the meantime, uh, I had said, I had suggested to J.U. That they, that they should have a College of Fine Arts because they didn't. They had good music, but they didn't really have any of the other arts. So then they said to me, okay, you create it. Then I said, well, I'll do it for one year. It turned out 18 years. <laughs> as dean of the College of Fine Arts. And then I said, I had an opportunity to become a president of a New York university because there were no women in these jobs. And this was 1979, and there were just no women. Flo Davis came to me and she said, you know, the faculty have said they want you as president. And I said, no. I said, why don't you run a, run a, a, a announce it and say that you have a campaign and you bring in somebody from outside. So they hired, they hired a, 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 com a company to come in and, and they brought in three people and the faculty just were nice enough. They said, no, we don't want them. We want her. So, so they said, would you do it? So then I said, well, I'll, these are my very words. I said, I'll help you out for a year. And it turned out to be 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> But I loved it. I really did. I, I did the same things that I did at, at Fine Art. And, uh, and one thing I did, I had all the, I had every once a month, I had all the presidents of the other schools come in and they met with me once a month. Of Edward Waters and, and uh, FCCJ and yeah. UNF. Wow. And, I took, and the superintendent of schools, I had him too. Wow. And so we, we, had a, we had a good thing. 
We really did. It seems like your mission is always to kind of bring people together. It is. It, you know, it is. What, where does where does that come from? What, why why do that? I guess because I want everybody to be happy. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I, that's a light answer. <laughs> light answer, but what I think it is because of the way I was trained, and I think that. Uh, you can accomplish so much more. You can accomplish so much more if you get everybody working together. Uh, and besides, you know, you're not, you have to expect with everybody having a different DNA that everybody isn't going to be happy all the time mm -hmm. and nobody, everybody's going to like you. And uh, you, you just, I was asked to be mayor one time. Would I run for mayor? And uh, my answer was not a polite one. I, I laughed. And I, then I felt embarrassed afterwards, but I just thought, I could never be mayor. I could never be. I'd be too sensitive about people and, I, and trying to get people together. And, and so I, I thought, no, I'll run a university, but I, I don't think I could do that. You were the first woman, one of the first women to join the Rotary Club, first woman to serve as president of the Rotary Club. This is the Rotary Club of Jacksonville, the right. downtown club. First woman to become a member of the River Club. Right. As the first woman, you really did blaze the trail for the rest of us. Did you think about that? What motivated you to do that? Oh, yes. I did think about that. I definitely did. And, uh, you know, finally, when I did become a president of the Downtown Rotary, then I was able to bring in a number of women. In fact, I think I brought in eight that particular year, or at least had other people help sponsor them. But. Um, I, I, I don't want to be where I'm not wanted, and I don't want to get anything because I'm a woman. I want to get it because I deserve it, and that's where I've always felt with, and, and perhaps as I would see women maybe not doing the things they could do, uh, instead wouldn't work, but thought they were women, thought they should get it. I think you have to work to do it, to prove yourself. Now, may, we probably have had to work a little bit harder. I know that I, I had in several instances. How about the younger women today who don't know that, who, who haven't lived through that? How do you let them know that it hasn't always been easy? It, it's interesting that you bring this up because I had an occasion when a young woman who had just received her bachelor's degree, 21 years old, and she came up to me, and she was always a very talented young woman and sort of followed me around wherever I went. And she said to me, Dr. Kinney, I've made my mind up what I'm going to do. I've decided that by 35, I'm going to be president of a university. And I said, this is great. Now, you do remember that you have a certain a path that you have to take in order to get there. Oh, I know that, she said. I know that. But I'm going to be there by 35. And I thought, well, bless your heart. If you can do it by 35, great. <laughs> but there is a feeling among many of them of uh, security, which is good, but also an unrealistic view of the path that you must take, whether, whether it's today or whether it's 30 years ago. Uh, and that's you better work. You're going to have to work. There is no other answer. It's important to know every piece of the journey, and you can't skip any of it. I don't care how many degrees you have. I don't care what your situation is. You, you, there is no substitute for work. How does an effective leader deal with someone who he or she is leading? Who has that sense of entitlement? My own experience with those who have that problem is that eventually the problem is going to halt them on their journey to being better and to being promoted. Usually they stumble. That's too bad unless somebody catches them up in the meantime. Leadership shows many qualities, but it certainly does show a desire to get something accomplished. And to get it accomplished, you have to have people working together. But you have to have a cause first. You, you, you can't just do, I've seen people try to do strategic plans and, and 
uh, long range plans and so on. But you have to have a reason for doing all of it. And you can't just walk into a, a club, for example, and, mm -hmm. and you have to have focus on what what is your cause? What is your reason? I like it when the universities, for example, at the bottom of every email will have what, why, why this institution exists. Like their mission statement. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Whatever your mission statement is. I like it when I know precisely what it is I'm supposed to be doing. What am I giving? What is it they want from me? If you have that, it is much easier. And how do you sustain that? How do you keep that, that drive going? Mm. Get a lot of rest and then have enthusiasm. I'm afraid that's the only answer. What happens when you reach a level of frustration? How do you handle it? You can, you can be assured that you are going to reach a level of frustration. I think that's SOP. I think you have to know that somewhere you're going to have that level of frustration. And for me, I, I, I handle it in a lot of ways, but, but a lot of people couldn't do that. But I go to the piano and play. And when I play the piano, I found there's an outlet. Whatever your outlet is, do it. <laughs> what, what have you sacrificed in your life to have the life that you've had? Probably uh, the life that took me overseas uh, for seven years meant that I wasn't near my family and uh, I, I'm, I lost a certain amount of opportunity, particularly with my brother who passed away at 44. So um, I think that's something that I lost, definitely. And I think that losing touch with one's family is, even though I learned so much and had a rich, wonderful life those seven years, that I lost a lot too. Because my father, of course, died then and my brother as well. What, what advice would you give to, to young people today? I think it's very important for young people to have hope. And I think to realize how very important it is to keep a positive view on life. And no matter what the challenge is, know that there is something there for you and that you have a DNA that nobody else has, which means no matter what age you are, you can do something no one else can do. So if you haven't found it yet, look for it. It's worth all the time you, you put in, whether it's in school or whether it's learning from somebody else, or whether it's sometimes challenges that you bumble yourself, but there's always hope on the horizon. Fran Kinney has shown us that even a simple girl from Iowa can do great things wherever her path takes her. World traveler, true friend to many, musician, educator, creator, and trailblazer. Fran Kinney has made Jacksonville a better place through her leadership. I really do believe I had a remarkable life.